Good evening. Is the microphone? Oh, there we go. My name is Richard Clear, and I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here tonight to the 2017 Woodrow Lloyd Lecture. Through the generous support of the Woodrow Lloyd Trust, the Faculty of Arts at the University of Regina presents an annual lecture in honor of the late Woodrow Stanley Lloyd, the eighth premier of this province. Lloyd was first elected a member of the Legislative Assembly of Saskatchewan in 1944. He served under Premier Tommy Douglas as Minister of Education. In that role, he undertook a radical redevelopment of Saskatchewan's education system, including ushering in Canada's first system of student loans and bursaries. Becoming Premier in 1961, he then played a formative role in the implementation of Medicare. The Woodrow Lloyd Lecture Series was established at the University of Regina in 1982 in recognition of Lloyd's leadership in education and public service. The terms of reference called for the lecture to <clears throat> be on an issue of direct relevance to Saskatchewan and for the lecturer to be a nationally or internationally recognized scholar, writer, thinker, and or activist. Past Woodrow Lloyd lecture speakers have included the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair, Senator and Chair of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Anne Livingston, a social justice organizer and an advocate for addicts' rights, the Honorable Preston Manning, founder of the Reform Party of Canada, and Dr. Cindy Blackstock, an advocate for Indigenous and children's rights. I invite you now to welcome Dr. Nilgan Under, Associate Dean of the Faculty of Arts, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Shima Khan. Dr. Shima Khan was born in India and emigrated to Montreal as a child in 1965. She completed a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry at McGill University, followed by a Master's degree in Physics and a PhD in Chemical Physics at Harvard University. In 1997, she moved into the industry sector where her research in pharmaceutical sciences culminated in about 20 worldwide patents. Since 2001, Dr. Khan's work has been in the field of intellectual property law. She has written about Canada's innovation strategy for the Globe and Mail's report on business, and from 2002 to present, she has also written a monthly column on Islam and the experience of Muslims. Her writing, over 150 columns currently, has explored what it means to be a modern, liberal, and practicing Muslim, particularly within the Canadian context. A selection of her Globe and Mail columns were published in the 2009 book of Haki and Hijab, Reflections of a Canadian Muslim Woman. According to Dr. Khan, the aim of her writings has always been to provide even-handed and forthright commentary on these issues while engaging readers across the country. Dr. Khan has been active in Muslim communities in Boston, Montreal, and Ottawa, and has founded numerous Muslim organizations. One of her most noted endeavors has been the Family Honor Project, a comprehensive multinational approach toward combating honor-based violence. Dr. Khan is regularly invited to speak on issues pertaining to Islam, Muslims, and pluralism. She was a keynote speaker at the uh, Jean Sway Foundation, a presenter for the prestigious TED series, and lecturer for the Aga Khan Museum Lecture Series, Islam and the 21st Century. In 2012, Dr. Khan was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for her service to Canada. Her talk tonight will explore the pressing issue, Islamophobia, and the experience of Muslim women, especially in Canada. Please welcome Dr. Shima Khan. Good evening. I'm just going to start my timer. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the University of Regina 
and in particular the uh, Woodroy Lo Woodrow Lloyd Trust um, Woodrow Lloyd Lecture Committee for this honorable invitation. And I also greet you with the greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. I also greet you from Ottawa, where it took a while, but we finally came to the realization a few years ago that there is only room for one team named the Rough Riders in this country. <laughs> so in the spirit of the Honorable Woodrow Lloyd, as we heard, who played such a formative role in the de development of the modern day education system, I hope that this lecture serves to increase our collective expanse of knowledge. The title is Islamophobia and Muslim Women in Canada. I had proposed this title well before the contentious debate about parliamentary motion M103, which proposed, amongst other things, that, quote, the government should condemn Islamophobia and all forms of systematic racism and religious discrimination. But before I get to the topic at hand, please allow me to tell you a little bit about myself and my journey. I arrived in Montreal from India as a toddler 51 years ago. And it was in Montreal where I experienced the fear of terrorism during the 1970 FLQ crisis. And where I experienced the horror of misogyny after the massacre of 14 beautiful women one December evening in 1989. These women were murdered simply because they wanted to study engineering. My first voting experience was monumentous, for I helped to keep the country together in 1980. I did the same during the nail-biter uh, of 1995, and I also became a hockey fanatic. I played ice hockey, table hockey, driveway hockey, pond hockey, I collected hockey cards, cheered the Habs, and I attended many Stanley Cup parades way back when. Along the way, I never felt any discrimination and I never felt any sense of being second class. Quebec and Canada allowed me to thrive. I remember the pride I felt when my Harvard University professors told me that Canadian graduate students were the best prepared. That was a testament to our excellent undergraduate institutions. I remember the love I felt for my fellow Canadians during the massive 1995 pro-Canada rally in Montreal. It reminded me of the Hajj, the pilgrimage that Muslims are required to make once in a lifetime to Mecca. It was a sea of individuals from near and far, united in their love for a noble ideal. Differences melted into a shared vision of the future. However, the mood changed in Quebec after then Premier Jacques Parizeau's infamous, infamous money and ethnic votes comment the night of the 95 referendum. For the first time, I was told to go back home while walking my eight-month daughter, eight-month-old daughter in a stroller in Montreal shortly after the referendum. When I moved to Ottawa in 1998, a man proudly brandishing his Canadian Legion jacket told me the same. Then came the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. And although there were a few more incidents, I never actually feared for myself or for my children. On the contrary, friends, neighbors, and complete strangers renewed my faith in the basic decency of Canadians. However, it was during the 2015 federal election that I felt vulnerable for the first time. I had never imagined that the federal government would use its hefty weight and resources to vilify Muslims. For the first time, I wondered if my children would have the same opportunity to thrive as I did. One is a budding environmentalist who wants to follow the path of Sylvia Earle. I don't know if many of you know, she's a very famous oceanographer. My son wants to be a lawyer and community organizer. And my youngest, well, she just wants to play with Christine Sinclair on the women's national soccer team. <laughs> During the federal election, the conservative message at the time was, you are Muslim, you are the other, 
you can't be trusted, and you will never belong. Unfortunately, Muslims, and in particular Muslim women, felt very vulnerable in view of this message. In January 2016, a little over a year ago, Environics Institute completed a survey of Muslims in Canada. And it revealed certain facts which belied facile stereotypes. For example, it showed that Muslims were, you know, at the time Pharrell Williams' happy song was, was in play, so I said Muslims were happy, happy, happy. And in fact, we were more proud to be Canadian than non-Muslims. If you can see, um, in uh, 2016, 83% of Muslims said they were very proud to be Muslim, uh, to be, uh, they were very proud to be Canadian, and uh, that was 10% more than non-Muslims across this country. Another stark difference was that an overwhelming majority of Muslims, 89%, were happy with the direction of the country, as opposed to only 56% of non-Muslims. So about a year ago, Canadian Muslims felt very proud of Canada and in the direction it was headed. However, if you analyze these results a bit closer and along gender lines, we found that fewer Muslim women actually shared the optimism about Canada than their male counterparts. For example, while both groups believed that their Muslim Canadian identity, Muslim and Canadian identities were very important, when asked to choose between the two, which is more important, being Canadian or being Muslim, women chose their Muslim identity at a far higher rate than men did. As a corollary, fewer women than men believe that immigrants should set aside their cultural backgrounds and try to blend into Canadian culture. That is, more women than men believe in hanging on to their cultural identity rather than blending in. And furthermore, female immigrants, Muslim female immigrants, indicated that their attachment to Islam increased since moving to Canada, more so than men. The survey was based on telephone interviews with 600 Muslims across the country. And it also provided an interesting snapshot of gender-based attitudes towards community institutions. For example, only one-third of Muslim women in Canada regularly attend a mosque, or attend a mosque at least once, once a week for prayer, compared to about 62% of men. The lack of female attendance is not surprising, given that many mosques do little to encourage female participation. What's also interesting is that a core of about 20%, that's one in five Muslim women and one in five Muslim men, were deeply unhappy about the opportunities for women to play leadership roles in these Muslim institutions. That may serve for an unmosked movement or the basis of, for the creation of women's only mosques, which have already started in the United States. When it comes to family life, a whopping 90% of Muslim men and women believe the responsibility for caring for the home and children should be shared equally. I was very surprised at that result. Because um, more men believe that the father must be the master in the home, placing the Muslim level of support for family patriarchy in 2016 at the same level for Canadians in the 1980s. So we're about 30, 35 years behind the times. However, if you look at those survey results from 2016, if you look at the age range of Muslim respondents from 18 to 34, the younger Muslim generation rejects patriarchy at roughly the same level as their fellow Canadians. So we're starting to see a generational shift. Now Muslim women, are less optimistic about relations with non-Muslims than Muslim men are. For example, a greater number of Muslim women worry about the reaction of Canadians towards Muslims. They also believe the next generation of Muslims will face more discrimination. And they're more concerned about media portrayal of Muslims and stereotyping by colleagues and neighbors. It seems that the crux of the matter lies in discrimination. 
as 42% of Muslim women say they've experienced some form of discrimination. Only 27% of Muslim men said the same. And such incidents occurred mainly in public places, at stores, in restaurants, banks, and public transit. Of these women who said they experienced discrimination, 60% wore some kind of uh, religious clothing, whether it's a hijab or a chadar or, or um, yeah, hijab or chadar. And 40% did not. What's also interesting is that one in five Muslim women have experienced some form of uh, troubles crossing into the U.S. at the U.S. border. What's interesting about that result, it's actually about 60% of them don't wear any form of head covering. So the majority, if you like, of non-identifiable Muslim women are the ones who experience trouble at the U.S. border. These worries are real because Statistics Canada reported that the number of police-reported hate crimes targeting Muslim Canadians more than doubled over a three-year period between 2012 and 2014. During that three-year period, Every, hate crimes against every other identifiable, identifiable group dropped. Against Muslims, it doubled. Now, the discrimination concerns are real as we look at the employment statistics from the 2011 National Household Survey. The unemployment rate of Muslims was 14% nationally compared to 7.8% of the Canadian population. And this is despite Muslims having, on average, a higher level of education. The unemployment rate was the highest in Quebec at 17%, which was double the provincial average. Similarly, the national unemployment rate amongst visible minorities is around 10%. Even Canadian-born Muslims who graduated from a Canadian institution fared worse than the national average. Their employment rate is 9.5% higher than that of the national average. And one can only imagine the difficulties of finding employment for the 60,000 Muslim women who had a single parent household. So clearly Muslim women feel more vulnerable about the future, given that they bear the greater brunt of discrimination than their male counterparts. These issues came to a head on International Women's Day this past March when 338 young women from across the country between the ages of 18 and 23, one from each federal riding, took over the House of Commons as part of a program called Daughters of the Vote. This program, created by Equal Voice, uh, was, to, was there to promote the participation of young women in politics and government. There was one particular woman who came from the riding of Sher Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, I was very excited when I read this. I thought, oh, I can put this in my talk. And then I found out it was actually a writing in Alberta. <laughs> so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, there was a, quote, Sas Saskatchewan connection. Uh, her name was Sorosh Has Hasana. And she rose in the house and gave a very powerful speech, which encapsulated many of the fears and trepidations that she has felt and that many people of her generation, many young Muslim women and men have felt. And she said the following, I fear being othered, profiled, and killed in my country. This, this was just you know, shortly after the Quebec City Massacre. I fear being othered, profiled, and killed in a country I call my own. My identity is challenged and my actions are heavily scrutinized. I'm simultaneously silenced into shame while being expected to apologize for the actions of a small group of people that do not represent me or anything I am. She asserted that her heritage wasn't a political platform to campaign on, and she closed to a standing ovation by saying, this is my Canada, and there's no seat for hate here. If you can catch it on YouTube, I really recommend, suggest that you do because it's quite a powerful 
it's about 30, 45 seconds, a very powerful speech. So as you can see, such discrimination is real and has a direct impact on the lives of young and old, if you like, any age, women and men. Perhaps this is felt strongly no more than January 29th, when six women became widows and 17 children were orphaned in Quebec City. The country came together with genuine compassion, love, and soul searching for about two weeks. Then Parliament, parliamentary motion M103, which had been proposed way back in December, came up for debate in the House. And one word in that motion, Islamophobia, was at the center of the debate. There were demonstrations, some acrimony. What's quite interesting is there was a similar motion that had been proposed and passed in the House back in October, with the very word Islamophobia used. And it was done so without any notice or fanfare. And just with a show of hands, how many of you have heard, had heard of this previous motion being passed? Okay, one. <laughs> right. So we're wondering what's going on. But before going into a little bit about the dynamics of that debate, I thought it'd be interesting to learn a little bit about the history of the term Islamophobia. It turns out that it was first coined in 1910 by a Frenchman named Alain Quillen. And he used the French word Islamophobie uh, to criticize French uh, colonial administrators for their treatment of their colonial Muslim subjects in North Africa. Um, and he is the first one, or the first one that we've recorded to have used this term in 1910. And it was used to describe, if you like, anti-Muslim behavior, anti-Muslim attitude, anti-Muslim um, discrimination. Edward Said, prominent Palestinian-American academic, was the first one to use the word in English in 1985, when he wrote about the, quote, the connection between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. He proposed in his writings that, quote, the hostility to Islam in the modern Christian West has historically gone hand in hand with anti-Semitism. However, the term Islamophobia gained traction in a series of studies in the 1990s by the Renimid Trust which, was, uh, which is a British think tank. The trust actually borrowed this term from these two sources that I just mentioned. And its 1997 seminal report entitled Islamophobia, A Challenge for Us All, documented closed-minded views of Islam in the UK. So in that report, it defined Islamophobia as really being a fear of the religion of Islam. And it listed several, if you like, definitions in that regard. So it said, Islamophobia is a perception of Islam as a single monolith that is barbaric, sexist, and engaged in terrorist activities. So the initial word, is, uh, the, the, the way it was used in that report was exactly the way you read it. The fear of Islam, Islamophobia. Today, there are a number of definitions of Islamophobia, thus leading to quite a bit of confusion. I just went online and I checked up a couple of reputable sources. According to the Oxford Dictionary, Islamophobia is, quote, the dislike of or prejudice against Islam or Muslims, especially as a political force. I didn't agree with that one. <laughs> Or if you go to dictionary.com, Islamophobia is hatred or fear of Muslims or of their politics or culture. And there's a third example which is quite lengthy and it comes from the University of Berkeley Center for Race and Gender, which defines Islamophobia as, quote, a contrived fear or prejudice fomented by the existing Eurocentric and Orientalist global power structure. It is directed at a perceived or real Muslim threat through the maintenance and extension of existing disparities in economic, political, social, and cultural relations while rationalizing the necessi necessity to deploy violence 
as a tool to achieve civilization, civilizational rehabilitation of Muslim communities. Quite a mouthful, yeah. So as you can see, there is ample reason for confusion about the term Islamophobia. It's like a Rorschach blot. It means different things to different people. Some have worried that the very word or the motion will have a chill on free speech, namely that people will be afraid to criticize Islam and its tenets. Others are concerned that only one religion was singled out in the motion. So let's just be clear about one thing. This is a motion. It's not a bill. It's not legislation. There are no laws being passed to limit anyone's free speech. Criticism of Islam and Muslims still goes on. They go online, anywhere and everywhere. And in the end, the motion was passed last Thursday. However, how do Canadians feel about motion M103 and the issues that the debate has raised? Now let's recap the main features of the motion. One, recognize the need to quell the increasing public climate of hate and fear. Two, Condemn Islamophobia and all forms of systematic racism and religious discrimination. Three, request the Heritage Committee to study the development of a government-wide approach to reducing or eliminating systematic r racism and religious discrimination, including Islamophobia. Four, collect data to contextualize hate crime reports and to conduct needs assessments for impacted communities and to present these findings within 240 calendar days. Now it turns out that as I was preparing this talk, just last Thursday when the motion was being debated and finally passed, the Angus Reid Institute had conducted a poll on Canadian attitudes towards M103 and it was released on Thursday. So we'll just go through a few of the results. Okay. So Canadians were asked, if you were a member of parliament, would you vote for, against, or abstain against motion M103? And if Canadians were voting in parliament, that motion would have been defeated. So you can see 42% of Canadians voted against, say they would have voted against the motion. Only 29% said they would have approved it. And 29% said they were unsure or they would have abstained. It's very interesting to see these results along gender lines. As you can see in the second set of bar graphs, 50% of men would have voted against it, while only 34% of women. There's more support for this motion by women than by men. And finally, you can see the age group how you know, different age groups would have voted. The older generations, 35 to 55 and plus, were quite strong in their opposition to Motion M103. It's the younger generation that said no. 37% uh, said we would support it, and 30% said no, we'd be against it. So is this a reflection of the future? Or is this just a reflection of the way people feel when they're younger and their attitudes change as they grow in age? The results were also instructive along, depending on how, what level of education people had. What's interesting to see is that those who had a high school education or less, 44% would vote against it, as opposed to 24% for it. College degree or tech school, again, 46% for, 24% against. But those who had a university education or higher, the majority, 40, 43% said they would vote for it, and 34% said they would not. So the results are divided along how educated a person was. Finally, very, very stark differences depending on which party you supported. 
Those who supported the Conservative Party of Canada, a whopping 68% said they would be against it. Reflecting, if you like, this is reflected by many of their leadership candidates. Uh, only 14% said that they would vote for it. Again, reflected in their leadership candidates, only Michael Chong has come out and said that he will vote for it. He, he, he did vote for this um, motion. What's interesting is that even the Liberals and the NDP, one third of the constituency said no, we wouldn't vote for it. Now, what about, uh, I think I have the provincial results here. Oh no, okay. Uh, they also had the results divided along the provinces. And what's interesting is that for the province of Saskatchewan, 47% of the residents, according to this poll, said they would vote against the motion. A bit slight, slightly higher than the national average. And the region where the, uh, there was least opposition to motion M103 was the, were the Atlantic provinces. Now, what about the motion being a threat to free speech? Well, according to the poll, one in three Canadians believe that M103 should not be passed because of this reason. What's interesting is that one in four Canadians don't believe M103 should be passed because they think it's a waste of time and it actually won't do anything. Now, there's also a group, one in three Canadians, that believe it won't do anything, but it's good to pass because it's a good symbolic step by the government. And finally, only 12% of Canadians believe that such a motion will actually help to reduce anti-Muslim anti discrimination. So you can see the reasons why people are against it and for it differ. But what seems to be a common thread is that the majority of Canadians, about 50 to 55%, believe that this motion really isn't going to do anything. It's just a motion. Now let's take a step back and see how Canadians view the Quebec City Massacre. There are actually four mindsets. And, actually no, I'll go to the next slide. So, Canadians were asked, to pick one of two views. It was sort of binary choice. They were asked, which of the two views is closer to your own? One, Canada has a serious problem with anti-Muslim attitudes and discrimination. Or two, the problem of anti-Muslim attitudes and discrimination has been overblown by politicians in the media. You kind of two very stark choices. And you can see that 55% of Canadians believe the problem is overblown whereas 45% believe that it's actually quite a serious issue. So we've got quite a split, and Saskatchewan is, you know, 48-52. The province where, the only province where the majority believe that it's a serious problem is, of course, Quebec City, not surprisingly, given what happened in that province. And then finally, people were asked, how many of you agree with the following statement? Lots of people I know are distrustful of Canadian Muslims. And you can see four in 10 Canadians agree to that. They say, yeah, I, I think a lot of people do not trust Canadian Muslims. Um, the highest is in Quebec. In Saskatchewan, about the national average. So we've got a lot of work to do, as you can see. And given the above, I think what's very difficult, and this is a, this is a conversation that Canadian Muslims have to deal with, is we need to recognize that some of the fear about Islam and Muslims is genuine. And it's primarily due to the terror attacks in Europe, the United States, and here in Canada. I was in Ottawa in 2014 when um, Corporal Strillo was murdered by a terrorist. And it was very scary. My daughter was in, at the university not far away and they were in lockdown. 
and at the time we didn't know what was happening. Now, Canadian Muslims, while we have nothing to do with those who commit terrorism, we have everything to do with healing the social fabric that is damaged by these acts of barbarity. Last week, Muslim communities across the UK began crowdfunding campaigns for the wounded and for the families of those who were killed in the London terrorist attack. Last month, two American Muslims began crowdfunding campaigns to raise money for the repair of Jewish cemeteries that had been vandalized in the US. And Muslim American servicemen and service women volunteered to stand guard at Jewish cemeteries across the US to prevent further vandalism. Those who worry about the erosion of, quote, Canadian values, well, we should engage with these people in an honest manner, rather than to denounce such questioning. The cultural values surrounding women, critical inquiry, freedom of expression and freedom of conscience in many Muslim countries, these are often at odds with the prevailing Western norms. As Canadian Muslims, we must have a meaningful debate about how to reconcile these two worldviews. While Canadian Muslims seek protection of rights, we must also emphasize our love and defense of this nation. We need to start thinking, what are the universal tenets of the faith of Islam that can be translated from one society to another? But what are the cultural norms of the old world that must be replaced by the new? Such deliberations must be made with care and with the recognition that Canada is a diverse nation, bound by shared values as enshrined by our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. By all means, we must respectfully discuss our differences while weaving a tapestry of shared experiences towards a more inclusive country. Let us remember that in the aftermath of the Quebec City Massacre, Canadians and Quebecers opened their hearts to Muslims across this country, letting them know that they're loved and supported. And our elected leaders set the tone towards healing. These profound acts of kindness help to repair the social fabric that extremists desperately seek to rupture. Their goal, whether it's in Quebec City or London or Paris, is to sow hatred, division, and fear, and we must not let them succeed. In 1951, at the Canadian Educational Association Convention, Woodrow Lloyd said, quote, education needs courage. The very fact that education, if it is vital, leads to purposeful change. This indicates the need for courage on the part of those who lead, because even purposeful change is always opposed. It is opposed by those who do not understand. So let each one of us answer this call and seek the courage to confront our own personal bigotry. Let us not remain silent when we come across instances of bias and prejudice. We must do so with humility and education, with the recognition of our common humanity. It will take courage to become soldiers of inclusion, armed with compassion, ready to confront xenophobia in all its forms, whether it's Muslims today or Aboriginals every day. And I, I must give um, a shout out if you like, or I must bring this courageous example of Saskatchewan Senator Lillian Dick, who is the chair of the Aboriginal People's Committee in the Canadian Senate. Today, she called for fellow Senator Lynn Bayak to resign from the committee for continuing to insist that the residential schools weren't all that bad and for insisting that she doesn't need any further education about what happened in those schools. We have the example of the courage of Imam Hassan Guye, who delivered the eulogy at the funeral of three of the Quebec City victims. After paying tribute to all six victims of the massacre, the Imam reminded us 
of the humanity of the alleged killer. He also noted that while six Muslim families were destroyed, so too was the family of the alleged shooter. And from the depths of pain emerged recognition of our common humanity. In his beautiful Quebec, Quebec anthem, Mon Pays, Gilles Vigneault wrote, À tous les hommes de la terre, ma maison, c'est votre maison. My home is your home. This theme, that our vast country is home to those who arrive on its shores, is also found in Aboriginal teachings. Our hearts, like the land, are wide enough to embrace all those who seek to call Canada home. Find your courage. It's already in you. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm the only one at the mic. Is it okay if I go? You, you may go ahead, yes. Um, what would you say to someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali, who uses her own experiences that, um, to try and discount Islam as a whole just based on her... Right. And she almost uses her gender experiences to say, well, because it's this, it's all bad. Right. Now, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, with Ayan Hirsi Ali, her experiences are horrific and they are genuine and I applaud her for speaking out about them. Her solution though to addressing these really disturbing issues is to blame the faith and to discard the faith. And I think her latest venture is to try the, to reform the faith but as an outsider, as someone who doesn't believe in the faith. She'll have some followers, but I can tell you that there are many Muslim women who've also experienced horrific violence because of their gender, who are fighting to regain their dignity and fighting against the misogyny and the violence, but they're doing so within the faith. And they're doing so within the traditions of the faith, and the faith is a source of strength to them. Okay. If you want another example, Malala Yusuf Zai. She was nearly assassinated by the Taliban. They were against education for girls. Before she was, before the attempted assassination, she and her father were trying to educate the girls in their city or village. And they would go and try to convince people. Her father would go and try to convince parents through arguments, through discussions, through talks. The Taliban tried to do the same, and people wouldn't listen, so they used the gun. And what was Malala Yousafzai's response? It was a response of nonviolence and a response to the call of education, and sort of a universal response. I don't know how many of you watched the you know the Daily Show with. John Stewart, when he had her on as a guest. And he, he, he was rendered speechless because she said, you know, I, 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 can't even, I wouldn't even hit the Talib who shot me because I would be just like him. And, just, and he, he, was, he couldn't believe it. But her response was very genuine. So uh, I think the issues Ayan Hirsi Ali raises are very genuine and they're very serious and yes, we must address them. But to do so by saying Islam is bad and you know, I wish it would die, um, that's not going to solve the problem. It just isn't. Uh, there are those of us who are trying to address these issues but within the faith. So as you say in the Quran, to you be your way, to be me mine, you know, to me mine. So we leave it at that. Uh, 
I'd like to say that um, I have a daughter who converted to Islam, and since she did a few years ago, I've done a lot of research and and uh, just considering a lot of things about uh, Islam and religion and can and uh, and can Canadian values and what have you. Um, I, I appreciate. Um, what you've shown us tonight and explained to us and, and your, your story. Um, but I'd like you to respond to um, a couple of things here. Just recently in February, a man named Tarek Fatah, who is the founder of the Muslim Canadian Congress, he spoke to the Canadian Senate in regards to national security. And I listened to what he had to say, and one of the things he said was that most mosques in Canada, their Friday congregation, congregational prayer is started out with uh, a prayer that asked Allah to give victory to the Muslims over the kafar, which is the infidel, or would be anybody who is non-Muslim. He also said in his talk that there are certain Muslim groups in Canada where there's widespread radicalization. And the other point that I would like to make is that with this M103, there was a progressive conservative um, member, David Anderson. He asked that the word Islamophobia would be removed from the motion and replaced with uh, wording that says um, to, con to gam to, pardon me, to condemn all forms of systemic racism, religious intolerance of Muslim, Jews, Christians, Sikhs, Hindus, and other religious communities. So I'm suggesting that was a very reasonable thing to say because I don't believe that um, Islamophobia should be used, especially when there's, there's no uh, clear definition of what it is. What uh, David Anderson suggested would be much um, more inclusive that would cover all kinds of racism and intolerance. Um, but that was shot down. It was not accepted. Uh, his his, his uh, suggested change was, was rejected. So I believe that Islamophobia Okay, uh, just give me one second here. I, I just believe that um, using Islamophobia is going to be used to shut down criticism to Islam. Can I answer your questions? Your yes, first two? Ahead, yes. So, yeah, so Tariq Fatah, I, you know, uh, I've had Globe readers send me exactly the same question. You know, um, Muslim, at Friday Muslim prayer, prayers, this is what these imams say. I, I told one reader, I said, go to a Friday prayer, record it, and send it to me. Because I have been to Friday prayers, I have never once heard that in my life. And I understand Arabic. I have never, ever heard that. I, I would like to know, I asked, I, what is that prayer? Please tell me what it is. Bring it to me, tape it. Bring it to me so I know what you're talking about. Because my personal experience, and I can tell you, I mean, there are Muslims here. How many of you heard that prayer at a Friday Jummah prayer? So you're taking the word of one man over the word of the rest of us. And all we ask is bring your proof. Get a recording. Bring it. Show it to us. And we'll okay. answer it. That's I, one. I, I wasn't saying that what he said was true or not, because I don't have evidence, but what I'm saying is giving you a chance to respond to that. 
So I just did. Yeah, so one, okay. I'm, I'm suggesting that Mr. Fatah is using alternative facts. <laughs> Two, no, really. Really. Uh, I suggest it's an alternative fact. As far as stu radicalization by Muslim student groups, if you read CSIS reports, if you read any kind of academic study of the, of the radicalization process, there's an excellent center in Montreal called the Center for the Prevention of Violent Radicalization. It's a think tank, and they have done exhaustive research. They have, they have in-depth reports, especially of a situation, very disturbing situation in Montreal, where a sizable group of Muslim students either went to or tried to go to Syria. And the radicalization process is in multiple stages. It often involves the internet. It often involves cutting yourself off. In fact, most of the time, all of the instances, gradually cutting yourself off from every mainstream organization, every mosque, your family, your usual friends, and you get a very close circle of people who don't tell anyone else. It's like a closed society. It doesn't happen through student groups because Muslim student groups in this country you know, are putting on things like Islam Awareness Week and, and, and sort of, you know, they're not involved in radicalization because if they were, they would be shut down. They would be shut down like yesterday because we have, you know, they're, let's, they're a spy, you know, the, the intelligence community is watching them very carefully, very closely. So again, bring me the proof instead of thoughts. That's two. Your third thing, you know what? I actually like Mr. Anderson's proposition. And his motion was proposed in the House, and it was accepted by the Conservative Party and the NDP. The Liberals voted against it. I see all this, you know, as political brinksmanship. It's, it's become a game. And I, when I saw Mr. Anderson's proposal, I actually liked it, and I would have voted for it. I have no problem with that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for this lecture. I'm, I'm come here to get educated and uh, I've enjoyed it. So thank you very much. I appreciate being here tonight. I had a question for you in my own, uh, I have many Muslim friends and I'm uh, for humanity for all people and freedom of religion for all people. That's how I feel. And um, I was wondering what you thought about, uh, I'm sort of a studier of the United States military complex and its interference in the Middle East and the uh, actualization of terrorism from there. I'd, I've never been there, so obviously I can't know much about it. But I wonder what you thought about, um, sort of, I don't justify any violence, but the sort of, what the Muslim people over there that, are, that do want to harm us, is there some justification for all the harm that we've brought over there through our tax dollars and what the United States and even some Canadian money has done to kill like 4.5 million people over there since 9-11 and, uh, and these things. These things do have an effect on how people feel. So I sometimes almost, um, I don't hate the fact that there's terrorists. I almost try to sometimes understand why they exist and, and it, I don't believe that anybody should kill anybody but I think most of the killing comes from the United States government more than it does from any jihadist group. So I just wanted you to reflect on it if you could. Thank you. Right. Well, I haven't studied it in depth, but just at a basic moral level, you know, we're trying to say that, you know, the root cause of terrorism is foreign policy. Well, then I can say the root cause of Islamophobia is, are these, you know, we can always say there's some kind of justification for and the thing is that uh, right now, the, the terrorist incidents against you know, people, uh, these quote ISIS inspired, they're not really for any political, I mean, they're not for any ideology except, for the, <laughs> except just for killing people. It's not because they wanna get back at the United States or they want to drive the US, it's just to kill as many people in the West as possible, and it is ultimate barbarity. And to say that, to somehow find some kind of justification because 
I, I, I no. You know, I, I might have said that wrong. Do you think that what's been perpetrated against the Middle East and uh, oh, has, without has a, lots yeah, to do with it? Without a doubt, I mean, uh, the Middle East is, the violence there is just, it's horrific. Um, yes, the United States has had a role, but so has Saudi Arabia. In and so, with the United States, maybe. But. You know, uh, so has Iran. Um, I think it's much more complex than to blame the big bad US. I think it's far more complex. And like I said, it's not something I study, so I won't, I mean, yes, do people, uh, of course, if you're there and a foreign power comes in and bombs you and, and kills civilians, of course you will develop a hatred for that foreign against that foreign power. That's just human. Um, but does that mean that's sort of, you know, an excuse for why these killings are happening here? I don't think so. Thank you. And um, I'm I'm starting a website called uh, Drug Addict for Humanity and 9/11 Truth. It's a different subject, but. Um, I'll look to uh, make some comments and hopefully communicate with you further on, on some issues that maybe sure. help educate you with that because I am educated. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. you. Poetry Slam was about her job. And it's, it's quite a powerful poem, and she's going to be sharing it tomorrow. And I just think, um, as a teacher, how can I advocate for my students who are Muslim? And it's a, it's a Christian school in a Christian context or whatever. So how can I advocate for them in a way that doesn't center them out? And, and I just wanted to say, too, that I really appreciate that you brought attention to the residential school. and. You know, you're up here speaking for your people, but you've brought attention to another issue that is close to my heart, and I just, I want to con commend you for that. But as a teacher, what would be your wisdom sure. or advice, maybe, for that? Okay, um, I'll just get to the second point first. Uh, you know, there, this is just a personal perspective, but for me, the most important issue for the soul of this country is the reconciliation mm -hmm. for what has transpired for 15 years decades mm -hmm. against the Aboriginal people. Uh, we, we cannot go forward as a nation until this is dealt with in a comprehensive, um, respectful manner. And I'll get to your point, but I, I just recommend, if, if you haven't read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, it's 500 pages, but please read the first 22 pages. Mm -hmm. It is a summary. It is only 22 pages, and it is very, very powerful. I'm tempted to send that to Senator Lynn Bayak. It's only 22 pages. <laughs> yes, do it. <laughs> but as a teacher, you know, I've been reading about how, I've been out of the university environment, but I've been reading how universities have sort of become a space where political correctness has gone haywire. That you know, you can't, you can't bring up ideas that may offend this group or that group. Uh, I remember when I was at Harvard, we had the most intense debates, and, you know, people would attack me for my faith, because at a place like that, I mean, most people were atheist or secular or didn't believe in God, and not just that, kind of looked down upon those who did. And I had a very close friend, she told me, she said, Shima, I believe, you know, belief in God is a crutch. You know. But it was during those debates that, at least for me personally, a lot of my identity was crystallized. And I think what you can do as a teacher is, yes, advocate for your student, but also advocate for your student strategies to deal with when they meet with opposition. How do you deal with people who disagree with you? Because you will. You will meet them once you leave the university. If anything, the university is the perfect petri dish to have these debates and exchanges and, you know, disagreements, but at the end of the day, you still leave with respect for the other person as your fellow human being. You can separate the disagreement from the personal, you know, and this is how you build a society, because when you let disagreements become personal, you start to get into very ugly spaces. 
So all I can advocate is, yes, you know, empower your student to speak from, you know, her heart, to be true to herself or himself, but also provide strategies. What do you do when someone says to you, I think your faith is a load of crock, or, uh, you know, I, Muslim women are oppressed, or, uh, because she's going to face that if she already hasn't. And this is the perfect place to deal with strategies, to come up with strategies, to make alliances. Um, and we're going to need more and more of that. So I hope. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you're that welcome. was awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your speech. I wanted to ask you, in the light of the recent attack that especially hit uh, Europe, do you, what do you think should be the answer of the state that are targeted from these events? And uh, if you think that there are some solutions to stop these uh, extremist uh, attacks? Wow, you know, if I had the answer to that. <laughs> uh, you know, I look at the response by the British and, uh, you know, I look at, for example, I look at the response here to Quebec City and the response in England, uh, how people came together, people from different backgrounds, different, and say, you know, we are together, we will not let this destroy us, we are stronger together and we will continue to live our lives and to strengthen our society. In terms of those who seek to perpetrate violence, that is a very complicated question. Um, the Center for Prevention for uh, Violent Extremism in Montreal has some suggestions. Uh, it involves a lot of engagement. Uh, one of the things that this center found, they examined for, along gender lines, and they found the appeal towards ISIS was different for women than it was for men. And for women, you know, they said they just started this research. For many of these women, they found that they couldn't, they felt that they couldn't live their lives as a Muslim in Quebec because of the stigmatization, because of the negative vibes. You know, it's, it's much more prevalent in Quebec than it is, frankly, in, in many parts of the rest of Canada. And for some of these women, they felt they just couldn't live as a Muslim here. And not just that, they just, to them, the, the modern ideals of feminism were just antithetical to what they thought, you know, living a life of a Muslim should be. Many of them just wanted a domestic life, to get married, stay home, and raise the kids in a way that they felt comfortable with their faith. And for them, the idea of migrating to a place, quote, this ideal place where all your problems would be solved, you know, it, they present, you know ISIS present, presents a very, dis, you know, utopian vision uh, of what life will be like there once you're there. You'll marry uh, this, you know, heroic jihadi who will go and fight for your, your honor and all this and will provide for you and, you know, you can raise your kids in, in a way that is free from Western... This. So we have to start engaging the youth, especially about in terms of their identity. We need, I think, mentors to show the youth, look, you can be a Muslim and you can live here. It's not going to be perfect. There's going to be challenges. But that's true anywhere you live because that's just part of being human. You know, so we need to engage with the youth to really, you know, welcome them and to have them engage uh, in the society and say, yeah, it's tough at times, but you know what? It can be done. Uh, and, and so it's going to take a lot of that. Yes, there is the law enforcement and the security intelligence component, and, and that's there. But this other side of sort of the human capital, I think that's where we have to come up with more and more strategies. And, and you know, if you have ideas like, you know, think about them and, and, for example, contact the center in Montreal. Like, they're very, very inclusive and very open towards ideas. So I don't have the answer, but I just think further engagement with, with the youth so they don't feel alienated is very important. Thanks. You're welcome. As a person who considers himself of no fixed religion, I'm wondering how we can bridge those gaps 
between our cultural differences and how we can come together as humans? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think we have to we have to go to some basic uh, universal shared values, um, respect for the dignity of each other, uh, respect for differences. There will be differences. And then when it comes to, you know, where there are differences, I mean, how do we, how do we bridge our differences, but how do we use those differences to sort of build a very multifaceted society? I went through the public school system in Montreal, and that's where I learned you're going to have differences of opinion. But you know what? At the end of the day, you're going to learn how to work with people who are different from you, um, find what's common, leave what you have is different, and build something out of what you have in common. I think that's what we have to look at. What can we build together with what we share in terms of our values? And there's so much to do in this country, so many initiatives. Uh, sky's the limit. So that's what I would recommend. Final questions? Okay. Oh. Yes, please. Good evening, Madame. I'm wondering when we use a term such as we've used to describe our theme for tonight, and we're having such a difficulty in describing that, but it is basically a foundation on, on the Muslim community in this country to various degrees in the, in, the, in the cities, in the towns and villages. I'm wondering how much of this reaction, if we may say that, against the Muslim people is based as a threat against the Christian community. The, the Canadian nation, I've been told, is founded on the Christian belief and Canada is a Christian based country. I've been told that by many people. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly believe that myself. But despite the fact uh, the Christian community is in to much of a degree crumbling before our very eyes, do you feel that perhaps the arrival and the consolidation and the depth and the strength of the Muslim community is seen as a threat to the establishment, not only the religious establishment, but the socioeconomic establishment that is represented through the Christian basis. Thank that's, you. that's a really good question. Um, well, I look at the history, if you look at the history of Canada in terms of, um, you know, the, the uh, perception of the latest group that have arrived, if you look at the 20th century, um, we had discrimination against the Sikhs, against the Chinese, against the Jews, against the Japanese, against the Eastern Europeans, against the Catholics. Well, I mean, aside from the, I, I don't like the term, I don't, personally, I don't like the term Islamophobia. Right. But, I mean, if we were to take it to mean, you know, fear or discomfort or anti-whatever Muslim attitude, I mean, there was a certain amount of fear against all those groups. This is why they were either not allowed or, you know, their immigration was curtailed or, you know, um, sent back. Uh, there was a real, if you like, dislike, distrust. I mean, if you read how in Ontario about, how, you know, the attitude towards the Catholics, like, it's just like the Muslims today, you know. You read, you read what people wrote about Catholics and their faith and their and the group and how they were... Like I read this and it's like just replaced with Muslims and it's the same kind of a commentary. So it almost seems as though there's one group that's made the subject of, if you don't want to use the term phobia, if you want to use a different term, of distrust, of dislike, of suspicion. And then once that's, that's done with, then, another, you know, then the focus will be in another group. And then when that's done with another group and so on. And 
my theory is that Muslims are the latest group. My, my hope is that we are the last group. No, really. It's like we don't... It's like we haven't learned our lesson, uh, you know, from our history. Maybe we don't know our history about how, you know, the discrimination faced by all these different groups I've mentioned. Um, and you may not, you, see, you think that's impossible, but it's, that's what happened. And you know, maybe in 10, 15 years, we'll look back and see how Muslims were treated and we'll say, oh my God, how could we have done that? Then maybe, are we gonna find a new group? I hope not. Um, and so, that's one thing. On the flip side, as I was having dinner with friends last night, I was saying, you know, if you go to Muslim countries, you know, uh, which are long established, almost, I wouldn't say closed, but if you were to have an influx, I mean, what did they do in Saudi Arabia with guest workers? They, they courted them off in, in colonies where they don't mix with the locals, right? Right, this is how it is. Um, so when you have a majority and you start to get an influx of people with different ways, different approaches, I think it's only human to feel a little uncomfortable. I acknowledge that. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's what do you do with it? Do you address it honestly? Do you have discussions? You know, um, or do we just give in to our biases and prejudices and say, well, these people, you know, they're never gonna integrate, they're never gonna, they're here, we'll just tolerate them. And, but again it, ha I, again, it has to be two ways. I mean, one of the things I've learned is that it has to be two ways. So Muslims, you know, yes, people do feel uncomfortable when they see the naqab. I feel uncomfortable when I see the naqab here, not in Saudi Arabia. Um, and we have to acknowledge that. There is a discomfort. I get, you know, I get a lot of feedback from Globe readers. I've gotten so much feedback over 15 years, and the, ones that I, the, the feedback I've valued the most are those who have disagreed with me. Because they've disagreed with me, but they've done it in such a respectful way, with such powerful arguments, that oftentimes they've changed my views. And I think that's the whole thing. If we can have respectful exchanges about the things we feel uncomfortable about, if we don't give in to political correctness and say, oh, can I talk about, I better not talk. No, please, please, let's talk about these things and acknowledge our discomforts and our commonalities and take it from there. I don't know, does, does that satisfy or? Were the Christian voices? Oh, I've seen it in Ottawa. And just another, you, you made a point about, is there a fear of the consolidation, the strength of the Muslim community? I, I almost chuckled because I... That was not my fear. No, no, but I'm just saying, our Muslim community is one of the most disorganized communities <laughs> on this planet. <laughs> if we were half as strong as people think we were... <laughs> um, Again, so it's perception, like people think we're like this united, strong, you know, we're gonna take over Canada, and it's like, we, you know, we can't get, we can't even get like for years, like the 10 years we couldn't get our, the pavement of our main mosque, you know, the, dry, the parking lot of our main mosque paved because groups were suing each other in the mosque. I mean, it's just, anyways, so. Okay, maybe two more questions sure. then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, my question is, uh, given the discrimination that many Muslim Canadians are facing, uh, how can I, as a non-Muslim person, be a good ally? Um, you can show your support. Uh, what we need are people to stand up in those forums where you know, bigotry is pronounced, right? Um, and I say this amongst Muslims, or, you know, in Muslim circles I'll hear people say things and I'll stand up to it, you know. So, in our own circle of friends and 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 um, you know social circles, we need to stand up against the bigotry that comes through. You know, like I said, whether against Muslim, whoever, that's one way. And to support. And sometimes even when it's within our own families. Too. <laughs> there you go. You'll hear it within your families. Um, you know, uh, I I'll be honest with you. You know, I, I was very lucky. My parents were very open-minded. And uh, they never, you know, forbade us from having friends of any different, you know, many, 
any faith. In high school, my closest friends were Jewish. You know, for me, it was very natural to have Jewish friends. And then, you know, later as I you know, became more involved in the Muslim community, I was like aghast at how for some people that wasn't the case. Um, and to speak up against the prejudices that we see within our own social circles, I think that would be go a long way. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening. I lived in Nigeria in a time when um, it was a very diverse society. The, the North was Muslim, and there were good portions of the country which were Christian. Nowadays, the North is experiencing a lot of difficulties with Sharia law and so on. I think when people think in terms of the term Islamophobia, a fear of Sharia law yeah. enters into that. And I'd like you to just speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so um, that's another thing I should point out. Some of the people fear, so Sharia law, again, it's like a Rorschach blot. It means different things to different people. If you ask Muslims, for them, it is, it is something very sacred and it is the law of God. For non-Muslims, it's chopping off hands, stoning adulterers or adulteresses, you know, very violent punishments for perceived criminal acts. And, you know, people worry about that encroaching in Canada. Um, I think it should be brought up because you know, this issue of Sharia law is, is something that I don't think is well understood within the Muslim community itself. It means different things to different people within the Muslim community as, as well. In Ontario, as I'm sure you're aware of, some 10, 12 years ago, there was a proposition to include Muslim law or Islamic law in settling family disputes and arbitration. And that was because up to that point, Jewish families who wanted to use Jewish law were allowed to. Those who wanted to use um, a form of Christian law, I and mean, there were some Christian communities too who used it. The Ismaili community, some members used that, and some Aboriginal communities who, who wanted to use uh, a form of religious law as the basis to settle disputes between husbands and wives who were divorcing. Um, and uh, that was allowed in the arbitration process because arbitration, the Ontario government decided, decided that family courts were very expensive and an inexpensive way to deal with divorce would be through arbitration. So there was a group of, there was a group of Muslims in Toronto who said, okay, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, we're going to allow, you know, we want to set up, uh, I forget the name of the, the Muslims, you know, Justice Institute or something. And we will, we will uh, deal with cases of divorce according to the four major schools of law in Islam. They're called, well, I won't go into that. And yes, was it a form of, quote, Sharia? Yes, it was. And then excuse my language, well, okay, all heck broke loose <laughs> in Ontario. Or for those Arab speakers, all Jahannam broke loose in, uh, in, in Ontario. And where people were saying, oh my God, you're allowing Sharia into Ontario. At the time, I was the chair of a grassroots Muslim advocacy organization, and we decided not to get involved, but then we decided to get involved. So I studied the issue. I, I, I asked, you know, I brought together a group of people and I said, so explain the arbitration process. And they did, and I said, oh, wait a minute, you don't have to be qualified, you don't have to have any qualifications in law or, or you, know, social, you know, social work or human rights. They said, no. So I said, the halal butcher down the street could be, you know, <laughs> could be the arbitrator? They said, yes. I said, oh. And then I said, uh, once there's a decision, can it be reviewed uh, to make sure it 
adheres to the Charter of Human Rights for gender equality? And they said, no. I said, oh. <laughs> and then I said, um, so the whole process is secret. Once it's done, no one knows about it. There's no transparency, no accountability. And they said, no. And I said, well, we have a problem. So I said, we're going to make a submission, but this is what we're going to submit. We're, you know, um, and they agreed. We're going to ask for changes to the Arbitration Act. Number one, the arbitrator has to have certain qualifications in terms of human rights and you know, Ontario law, and we put all this. Number two, the process should be transparent and reviewable, taking out you know, for privacy considerations, any names or whatever, to make sure that it does adhere to the Charter of Human Rights. You don't want a settlement where a woman is deprived of her rights simply because she's a woman. So we put all these conditions in, and we said, with these conditions, Muslims should also be allowed to do this, but provided those conditions are met. Well, Dalton McGuinty said no, and said, but what he did do is he did change the Arbitration Act to include everything we had recommended. So we were very happy. But in retrospect, I think we were wrong. And I'll tell you why. It turns out that in Thrace, Greece, right, they've been actually having Sharia in family law arbitration for a number of decades. It was part of an agreement with the Ottomans. There's a Muslim majority population in Thrace, and, and so their family uh, you know, disputes between husband and wife in terms of divorce are using Islamic law. And so they've done a study over the past 20 years, and the conditions were almost the same. It has to adhere to the, you know, the, the Greek, uh, whatever, constitution. It has to, you know, very similar conditions to what we place. What they found, of course, is there hasn't been enforcement or oversight, and the incidence of child marriage has gone up, and the incidence of women not receiving their fair share has gone up. So it hasn't worked. On paper, it seems like a great idea, but let's remember, these are human beings. And so when I look at that, I think we were wrong. That's my personal opinion. I know this topic could go, this discussion yeah. could go on much right. longer. Thank you very much but, for yeah. addressing it. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, before we conclude tonight's event, I would like to thank Dr. Shima Khan for this thought-provoking, informative, and insightful talk. Her talk is definitely an invitation to all of us to reflect upon our own prejudices and biases with a view to achieving a much better world. And it is also important to appreciate and understand the diversity of experiences uh, in Canada, especially in this historical moment. I would like to take a moment to thank the people who have contributed to the organization of this event. Our gratitude is first and foremost to the generous support of the Woodrow Lloyd Trust Fund. I would also like to acknowledge the efforts of the Woodrow Lloyd Lecture Committee, which includes myself, Claire Polster, Florence Stratton, and Jeff Lux. And the committee's work has been supported by the organizational efforts of Milagros Cherries. She's, she's right over there. Thank you, Milagros. <laughs> Finally, I would thank you all for coming and sharing your ideas, your questions with us. Uh, please uh, just uh, join us uh, in the lobby for some refreshments. If you have some questions, maybe you would like to talk to Shima again uh, without, uh, without tiring her out too much. She's been talking for over an hour. Thank you all. Thank you all. Good night.